Welcome back to Rand on Real Estate. I'm Greg Rand, WABCRadio.com and WABC, 77 WABC. I'm here with Laura Smith. How are you? It's great to be here. Always learning something with you. Good. Well, thank you. Um, we're going to talk about uh, real estate now. You know, the name of the show is Rand on Real Estate, so I have to make sure I get to these kind of topics. But it's going to be kind of a combination of politics and real estate here because the the President's Debt Commission came back with a recommendation, a multifaceted recommendation. I'm sure you read about it where um, they were going to be changing the tax code, cutting spending, and um, reducing the deficit. And there's a lot of debate going on. I didn't actually pass the commission, which kind of confused me. I mean, if you have a commission that makes a recommendation, and then the commission itself didn't vote for the recommendation, I don't get how that could be a recommendation. I was a bit confused. It had to have 14 out of 18 votes, and it only got 11, and so they circulated the recommendation and then didn't pass it. But anyway, what was in there that caused a lot of people in my industry a lot of heartburn was that we're going to change, they're recommending to change the mortgage interest tax deduction. You might have heard about this. Let me explain it because, once again, you turn on the TV, nobody explains anything anymore. They just tell you what it is and then move on to the next story. In 1914, when the income tax, it was actually 1913, the income tax was ratified in a, um, uh, an amendment to the Constitution that they could legally, constitutionally put an income tax in place. The first thing they did in the very first income tax code was put deductions for all kinds of things, and interest was one of them. And then years later, they eliminated interest on things like personal loans and credit cards, but they always left in place the mortgage interest tax deduction. So if you're paying a mortgage payment, you're paying $1,000 a month in a mortgage payment, and of that $800 is interest, that $800 comes off of your gross income to reduce your taxable income. So you basically get a tax break for being a homeowner. It's been around for almost a century. And now that they're trying to find a way to close the deficit, after having blown spending through the roof, they now want to find a way to reduce the deficit. And finding little pockets of money to get their sticky fingers on is part of how they're doing it. So they saw that and they said, the mortgage interest tax deduction, if we eliminated it for people with mortgages or for mortgages with balances over $500,000. So you can only deduct the interest off your taxes um, that is f- for five hundred grand or less. Right now it's a million dollars or less. All right, so they, the way that they say in the government is that we would um, save this amount of money, um, some untold billions of dollars, if we reduce the mortgage interest tax deduction down from a million to $500,000, which, by the way, I love when they say that, how they could save money. What do you mean? You're not spending the money. It's, you're collecting more money or less money from people, but they really do see it. When they, when they talk that way, you can tell they actually see it as their money that we're just holding on to after we earn it until we give it to them. But here's the key. This is not going to change anything significant in the housing market long term or even midterm, all right? And I'm going to get a lot of hate blog from people in the real estate business for this and the banking business because, you know, nobody wants to see their industry targeted with any kind of a tax increase. And I think tax increases are the dumbest thing you could possibly do right now. But I wanted to just make the point that by increasing the taxes on the people that have more than a half a million dollar mortgage, you're stinging them. And by the way, it doesn't make a lot of sense in the context of the last two years. It's all been about relief for troubled homeowners, right? It's been about mortgage modifications and freezing foreclosures and helping people that are, that are in dire straits with respect to their mortgage. So I don't quite get how they made the jump from that to increasing taxes on people with big mortgages because, you know, the folks who are going to get hit hardest by this are the people that live in expensive areas. And the hardest hit markets in the country in the foreclosure crisis are Southern California, like Los Angeles, San Diego, Phoenix, Miami, Las Vegas. These are all places that have high average sale prices. So all of their efforts to try to um, ease the pain of troubled homeowners are not being served very well by increasing the cost of those big mortgages. But having said that, that just is an example of them flailing around and having no consistency in their solution set. But what would the impact be? On the short-term foreclosure crisis, it would make it a little bit worse because it's making it harder for some of those folks to make their payment. What is the impact going to be on the housing market? Absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. Now, why? Think of this housing crisis as a hurricane, all right? A big one, a category whatever, category five hurricane. 150 mile an hour winds, buildings getting lifted off the ground, just the worst kind of hurricane you can get. And then imagine you're underwater about 50 feet. Do you feel the hurricane if you're underwater? Does the hurricane change high tide and low tide? It doesn't. <laughs> All right. If high tide's going to be at 6:15 a.m., hurricane or not, high tide's going to be at 6:15 a.m. 
the housing market is like the tide, all right? It, the demand for housing is driven by the most fundamental drivers of any product on the planet. It is real estate in America. If population is growing in America, if people still like living in, indoors, and if people still like the idea of owning their home, as long as those three things are intact, the housing market's value is going to be intact. So even after a correction like we're experiencing right now, or even like the correction that ex was experienced during the Great Depression, after all the dust settles, after the hurricane moves on, everything settles and gets normal again. But even during the hurricane, the tide is going to change the way it always does. It's, it's not stoppable. So don't, don't let anybody spook you into thinking that somehow any of this foreclosure crisis doesn't really matter when it comes to the housing market's long-term resiliency. Changing the tax code doesn't matter. None of the stuff matters. It's all weather on the surface. We're really down at the core where we're still dealing with the most resilient product that you could ever invest in. And I say that even though it's not self-serving at all. It's, it's contrary to my own personal interests. Um, but I, I, it's more important to me that people internalize the kind of faith that I have in real estate, the kind of faith that successful investors have in real estate. We, don't, we know that the value is going to come back. We know that after a boom is going to come a crash. The bigger the boom, the deeper the crash. But when it's done, it's going to plateau. It's going to level out. And then sometime down the line, we're going to have another boom. And it's only that belief, that really deeply held faith, that causes people to have the guts to borrow large sums of money, to buy real estate and to hold it, and to have the kind of patience that's required to turn a real estate investment into a fortune over an investment career. Um, so that's the important thing, is not letting all these little short-term zigs and zags um, impact your fear and your concern about where the market's going long-term. And why is that important? Because as we're going to talk about in the next segment, there are places in this country that are in a really bad place in the short term. We've spoken before about Florida. Florida is very well known as being one of the hardest hit markets of the housing crisis and the foreclosure crisis. And the reasons for that are pretty straightforward. Florida was a hot place, not literally, you know, the real estate market was hot. And a lot of development started happening on the waterfronts down there. A lot of homes were built. A lot of high-rise condos got built. The developers were getting loans from banks. The investors and speculators were getting loans from banks. They were buying without any money down. They were buying and flipping. It was all the worst kind of strategy of real estate investing, all concentrated in one place, South Florida. So when the music stopped, you had half-finished buildings, half-built subdivisions, a whole lot of speculators who got caught with the hot potato, and the market's in the crapper right now. Can I say, can I say crapper on the air? <laughs> I suppose it's okay. I guess I said it twice already. We, if not, we'll bleep it <laughs> okay. out. There. They're, they're in a very, very tough spot in the state of Florida. But what is the reason why Florida has done so well over the last 40 years? Why has Florida's population grown steadily over the last 40 years? Very simply, the climate. This is not complicated, okay? People like it when it's warm. They've got, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of waterfront coastline. The whole state is a waterfront. So Florida's natural resources, its climate and its weather, have drawn people into that state, growing the population, and the baby boomers, 72 million of them who are now entering retirement ages, the vast majority of which live in the Northeast, they go down I-95 and they go to Florida. So faith and understanding at what supports and grows real estate values, knowing that it's real estate in America. So as long as it's still America, and America is still the right place to live, the best place to live in the world, which I believe it is, I think you probably do also, as long as that's still intact, and as long as you look at the big picture trends, and what you see is short-term pain inherent in long-term gain, that faith is what causes people to make moves in markets like this. This is a scary time. This is what it feels like to buy low. It's painful and it's scary but that's the beauty of it because it scares your competition away. Mm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay, so we come back. We're going to talk to somebody who's in Florida, southwest Florida, who's doing a lot of investing and a lot of, um, a lot of work with investors. He's going to tell us exactly what he's seeing and where the money's being made. So stay with us. Rand on Real Estate, 77 WABC.